the next speaker that I'd like to call to the podium is no one less than Alistair Kent, who is an old friend of, of myself and uh, an old uh, pioneer in the field of rare diseases and genetic diseases. Alistair is the uh, director of Genetic Alliance UK, the national charity of over 180 patient organizations supporting all those affected by genetic conditions. Um, Genetic Alliance's UK mission is to promote the development of the scientific understanding of genetics and the part that genetic factors play in health and disease, and to see the speedy transfer of this knowledge into improved services and support for patients. And Alistair is also the chair of Rare Diseases UK. But I know, Alistair, you have a, an important message to bring, so I won't just uh, stand here using all the time mentioning all your merits. Alistair. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'd like to start by thanking the Minister for her kind remarks, uh, her very welcome remarks, uh, and also by welcoming you to, to this conference, uh, welcoming you to the UK, that most European of nations in, 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 the, uh, in the Union, uh, and, and to Edinburgh, uh, the capital of, of Scotland. Uh, Edinburgh is, is sometimes uh, described as, as the Athens of the North uh, because it's a beautiful city. Uh, I think this is a mistake. Uh, Athens should more rightly be described as the Edinburgh of the South. But more importantly, I think, is the commitment that Scotland has shown, which the Minister has, has highlighted, to developing services and support for Scottish patients uh, with rare diseases. Uh, and I'd like to pay tribute to the work that has gone on here, particularly to the work of, uh, of Liz Porterfield and her team in the Scottish uh, Executive, uh, and to Deirdre Evans and colleagues in the National Services Division of Scotland, who have been uh, absolutely essential in, in their efforts to, to move things forward for patients and families here north of the border. The theme of this conference is game changers uh, in rare diseases. Uh, and I think we stand now uh, on the cusp of a unique opportunity. We have a coming together of factors that potentially create a perfect storm, a unique opportunity to bring together elements from across the spectrum, from across the continuum, from, from science, from medicine, from industry, from patients, from society, to make it possible really to change the possibility of patients and families with rare diseases enjoying a life which has quality and quantity better than could have been hoped for uh, in just, uh, uh, just a few short years ago. Now, why do I say that? What, what are these things that come together? I think, first of all, we're facing an increasingly rapid pace of change. Homo sapiens has walked this earth for about 200,000 years. And 200,000 years ago, when the first man and the first woman stuck their head above the edge of the Olduvai Gorge in the Rift Valley in Central Africa and looked around them, and they said, well, blow me, I've got dilated hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. <laughs> and the kids got Duchenne. Now, where did that come from? You know, for the next 197,500 years, nobody had a clue. There was nothing that we could do or understand to change the impact of life-limiting diseases. About 2,500 years ago, the ancient Greeks thought that our disease, our health, our well-being was controlled by the movement of the stars and the planets. And they thought they could diagnose disease by examining the entrails of a disemboweled chicken. I'm not sure many people got cured by that, but it kept the, uh, the Greek poultry industry going for a while. 800 years ago in the Middle Ages, we thought that medicine was... Uh, uh, 
brought about by controlling the four humours uh, that influence disease. So if you had fever, we bled you. If you had uh, other diseases, we purged you. Well, purging and bleeding might have helped a few people. If they had diarrheal disease, it probably helped. If you had hemochromatosis, bleeding probably sorted you out. But for the vast majority, it made no change. Probably made you worse. Half a millennium ago, Vesalius, the father of human anatomy, started investigating what went on inside the body and realized that things inside the body affected our experience of, of, of health and, and disease. And then 200 years ago, uh, we went from the idea that disease was caused by bad air, by miasma, to, uh, to the idea that germs. We had Semmelweis with his little animalcules down the, the microscope. John Snow and the, 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 the pump uh, and the, the cholera epidemic and Pasteur with the germs. And then 150 years ago, Lister and antisepsis made surgery less of a, a life or death experience. 80 years ago, antibiotics appeared on the scene and pioneers such as Fleming, Dorothy Hodgkin, Bayer produced the first uh, sulfonamide drugs, the beginnings of scientific medicine. And then 60 years ago, just as I was about to learn to walk, uh, James, Watts, uh, James Watson and Francis Crick walked into the bar of the Eagle Pub in Bennett Street in Cambridge and said, hey guys, I think we've just won the Nobel Prize. We've just discovered the structure uh, of DNA. And then 35 years ago, we had monoclonal anti antibodies, the first biological medicine. And 14 years ago, the human genome was sequenced at a cost of millions or billions of dollars. And as a result of an investment of hundreds of thousands, probably millions of hours of scientific effort on the part of uh, thousands of scientists worldwide. Today, we can sequence a genome for under $1,000 in less than 24 hours. So, you know, in, in recent years, we've gone from considering disease as being a result of movement of the stars to the movement of molecules. And that understanding gives us the opportunity to investigate the fundamental biological processes that have gone wrong, that result in disease, and to think about interventions that will address those faults in our underlying biology, to tweak the molecules and potentially treat, prevent, or cure genetic diseases. That is a fantastic opportunity. We are the first people ever to walk the planet who can see that possibility. And the challenge for us is to seize that opportunity, to sustain the engagement that we have in high quality biomedical research and to make the commitment to translate that new knowledge into interventions that will improve the quality and the quantity of lives that we as patients and families with rare diseases uh, can, ex can expect to enjoy. Just think about it. You know, before you, there was no possibility. Ahead of you, there is every possibility. Our challenge is to realize that. But that's not the only thing that's changed. That's not the only thing that is making this possible. For rare diseases, we have also undergone a, a sea change. You know, a few years ago, if you said, I've got a rare disease, the attitude of professionals, of healthcare systems, of industry, of society at large was, well, if it's rare, uh, it can't be very important. There's only a few people affected. There's nothing we can do about it. You know, so why should we bother? We don't have to have that argument any longer. We don't have to justify our claim for health care. Now we realize that there are at least six to 8,000 currently identified rare diseases and the list is growing on a daily basis. We realize that a substantial proportion of our health care expenditure is devoted to the care and support of patients and families with rare disease. We recognize that rare diseases are a huge, a significant cause of human, of human suffering and a significant consumer of healthcare resources. But the challenge 
is to realise how best to spend those resources, to maximise the health gain, so that for every dollar, every pound, every euro we spend, we get the best possible return in terms of improvement of the quality and quantity of lives for patients and families with rare diseases. That means thinking about new ways of delivering healthcare. It means refining the diagnostic pathway so patients and families don't rattle around the healthcare system like bees in a bottle, banging off the sides, until if they're lucky, they find the little hole at the top that takes them out into the area of treatment. But more often, they collapse exhausted and fall to the bottom of the bottle and die. We must change that, and we have the opportunity to change that. But we will do it by thinking radically about how we organize and deliver health care. And the voice, the experience, the understanding, the engagement of patients and families with rare diseases will be essential components in that problem. And we have won the argument about making that central. Nobody now is not talking about rare diseases as an important issue in the in consideration of investments in biomedical research, uh, in pharmaceutical industry engagement. There was a meeting recently uh, in London of companies in the Association of the British Pharmaceutical Industry who are interested in rare diseases. They had to find a bigger room because so many, in so many companies are interested in the rare disease arena as a way of, uh, of solving healthcare problems. A few years ago, if the ABPI had had that meeting, had called together representatives of companies interested in rare disease therapies, you could probably have held the meeting in a telephone box. For those of you who are too young to remember them, a telephone box was where you used to have to go to make a phone call when you were away from home. You could have had the meeting in the telephone box and still have been room for the buffet because there were so few people uh, interested. So there is that groundswell of engagement. There is that recognition by healthcare systems. But healthcare systems can't do it all. They need us to go with them. They need us to stimulate them. They need us to hold their feet to the fire so they don't shy away from the difficult decisions that have to be made about resources, about organization, and about allocation. And thirdly, we have the rise of patients and families. A few years ago, we were seen as, as the subjects, you know. There was this vertical hierarchy yeah, where, you know, scientists researched, industry invented, doctors prescribed, and patients took. And we were supposed to be grateful whether it worked or not. That's not the case now. Now we have to be seen as partners, you know. We have insights, we have experience, we have expertise we can bring to the table. We know more about our rare diseases than most people. Yeah, I know, I'm finishing. <laughs> and soon, we will be the agenda setters and drivers. We will be framing the research questions alongside the scientists, alongside the clinicians, alongside industry, alongside the policymakers. We will be driving the research. We will be bringing the public with us so they know why what we need, what we want, is important and support our efforts to get it. So looking ahead, the game changers, the theme of this conference, we have the vision and the opportunity. And just a few quotes. Now, the first one, from mud through blood to the green fields beyond, is the motto of the Royal Tank Regiment. We as patients have gone through the mud. We've had the struggle to make ourselves heard. We're in the bloody bit now, sorting out what we want to do, marshalling our resources, but we can see the possibility of a successful outcome. The disability movement often uses the slogan, nothing about us without us, stressing the need for engagement and involvement of those people who have direct experience. It's not their slogan. The first recorded instance of that slogan, Nihil de nobis sine nobis, appeared in the Polish constitution of 1505. But the principle still stands. As patients and families, we are part of the solution 
and we demand to have our voice, our expression heard. Lincoln Steffens, coming back from Moscow in 1919, said, I've seen the future and it works. I'm not sure he was right in the particular instance that he quoted, but the idea was right. We can see that it is possible to address these challenges. We know that it is not too difficult. This is not a problem that is beyond the wit of humankind to address and to resolve. And the optimism of Barack Obama, yes, we can, should be coupled with the determination, yes, we will. And we are now on that cusp. As Winston Churchill said, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. To come full circle, we are the first people, the first people to walk this planet who have within our grasp that potential, the tools to understand and the opportunity to do something that will change the future for patients and families with rare diseases. So, to conclude, John Ebden, a famous broadcaster and on British radio, now sadly died, always used to end his, performance, his, his broadcasts with, if you have been, thank you for listening. And if you have been, thank you for listening to me.